Welcome to the fourth season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you are a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Cape Breton Island is breathtakingly beautiful. Located in Nova Scotia on the eastern seaboard, it is home to lush and forested mountain peaks with craggy cliffs that reach down to the rocky shores where waves crash and gurgle over the rocks. When the fog rolls in, the air is so thick with salt, you can taste it. The Atlantic Ocean provides a livelihood for the lobster fishery. It's a cold and unforgiving job, one where the crews make a pact with the sea, hoisting their traps over the side rail and into the frigid ocean, where they sit overnight, waiting for their catch. There's not many ways to make a living in a small island town, and its residents take fishing very seriously, particularly as lobster season is only two months long. During the summer of 2014, in Petit de Gras Island, nicknamed PAG, 650 tons of lobster were caught. Each boat has a license which dictates how many traps it can use and the area it can fish. As the lines are drawn in the water, so too are the lines between men and their boats. It is an unwritten rule that a boat does not cross that line. But occasionally, an argument will ensue and tempers will flare when the lines get blurred. Lobster fishermen are up before dawn and head out early while the water is still calm. Once the sun rises, the winds pick up. Bait is added to the traps, and five or six are strung together with a rope and lowered into the water with a buoy at the end. After an overnight soak, a gaff or hook is used to snag the rope. A winch on the boat then hauls up the traps. In mid-May, the catching is good, but as the end of the season draws near in mid-July, the catch drops off. The lobster fishing industry can be lucrative some years, yet most homes in PAG are small and humble. Philip Pedro lived in a modest home overlooking the harbor with panoramic views of Mackerel Cove, where he grew up with his parents, older sister Margaret, and brother Gerard, who was a fisherman. At a young age, Philip was drawn to a life of petty crime, which started out as a joke with his friends, escalated into multiple charges and lengthy stays behind bars. Philip was likable. He would give money in his pocket to anyone who needed it. Family and friends appreciated his support. But over time, Philip became a brazen outlaw who didn't try to hide his crimes. Rather, he flaunted them. Philip was loved by those close to him and feared by those who weren't. Philip was adept at picking on those he determined to be weak. He bullied them, threatened to burn down their houses, and stole lobster from their traps. But when things got too hot and the law was looking for him, or an islander was angry with him, he'd go on the run and disappear, sometimes for days or weeks at a time. Philip's passion for stealing began when fishermen hired him to steal supplies. He stole their generators, radar detectors, and their ATVs. He terrorized them. As the thefts escalated and he stole from those who hired him, they now despised him. During Philip's many stints in jail, the town got a brief reprieve. Most dreaded his return, particularly during lobster season. 
Philip snuck out at night after the fishermen had set their traps. Under the cloak of darkness, he would move along the water, looking for an orange boy. Then give the rope a hard tug, pull up the trap, open the door, and remove the lobster. Then as a taunt to the fishermen, he lowered the trap back down with the door open. Sometimes he'd cut the rope and watch the traps disappear to the ocean floor. Heading back to shore while the sky was still black, he wouldn't even try to hide his stolen catch. And it seems the local fisheries and police often looked the other way. Perhaps they were just tired of dealing with Philip's petty crimes, or perhaps it's because the locals wouldn't turn in one of their own. Either way, it appears their lack of action and silence gave Philip control of this tiny fishing town. To improve the odds of his poaching, Philip purchased a speedboat he nicknamed the Midnight Slider, a 13-foot fiberglass hull with bench seats. The exterior was white with a red stripe and the interior bright red. Philip raced around the harbor. Near the corner store, he'd tie up his boat at the dock, pick up a coffee, and share a laugh with the locals. 67-year-old James Landry was a lobster fisherman in PAG for 50 years. The unrelenting ocean and gale force winds had not hardened the grandfather of two. He always welcomed everyone with a smile. In a small town like PAG, Everyone knows everyone. And even though Philip had bullied James, stolen lobster from his boat, and threatened to set his house on fire, James still stopped by the Boudreaux families to share a cup of tea and gave his parents money to help out Philip when he was in prison. On the twin Maggie's fishing boat, James worked as a deckhand, along with Craig Landry, his third cousin. His son-in-law, Dwayne Sampson, was a captain. A CBS documentary described how on Saturday, June 1, 2013, Gerard saw his brother Philip and the Midnight Slider on the water at 6 a.m. The twin Maggies headed out before dawn, as usual. Then something caught Craig's eye, and he mentioned it to Dwayne, who glanced over and said, Philip? mostly playing with the traps again. Dwayne gunned boat towards Mackerel Point. Dwayne ordered Craig to put three shells in the gun and said, he's going to get a scare this time, and asked James if he was going to shoot. James replied, yes. James raised the rifle and fired off a shot but he couldn't tell where the bullet landed and thought he might have hit the midnight slider. Craig turned his head. He didn't want to see. Then James fired off two more shots. Then he heard James cock the gun again, and another shot rang out. Craig had enough. He said, stop, no more shooting. The gun fell silent, but it was too late. One of the bullets had hit Philip in the leg. James ordered Craig to go around, hit him, run him over, and sink him. Dwayne guided the 35-foot twin Maggies toward Philip's small boat and rammed it hard. But the fiberglass midnight slider managed to stay upright with Philip in it. Dwayne turned the fishing boat, rubbed it up to full speed, and ran Philip's boat again. Craig couldn't bear to watch, but he heard the thud. The midnight slider dipped under the water, but popped back up. His fiberglass cracked with deep gashes. Philip was still inside, hanging on for life. Dwayne steered the twin Maggies towards Philip and took another run at him, hitting his boat hard. 
This time, the collision knocked Philip into the water. He managed to grab on to a floating gas can. Court records reveal that Philip begged James to stop, telling him, Please, James, don't shoot me. I didn't steal your lobsters. Dwayne and James told Philip he won't be cutting any more of the traps. James instructed Dwayne to go around and said he'll gaff them and they'll tow him out. As Dwayne steered the boat around, James told him to slow down. He swung the gaff at Philip and caught him, but then it slipped. So James swung it again, but Phillips managed to slip out of his sweater and free himself. Then on the third try, Craig saw James finally hook Philip. Philip's body turned and his face dipped into the icy water. Dwayne steered the boat to deeper water. James asked him, how deep are we? Dwayne answered, 12.2 fathoms, which is 73 feet. James said, that's deep enough. Stop here. Craig walked over to the rail. Philip's head was turned to the side. Dwayne told them to grab the anchor. Dwayne stepped out of the wheelhouse, tied a rope around Philip's neck. It was unwound around his arms. James grabbed the other end of the rope and tied it to the anchor. Dwayne picked up the anchor, then dropped it in the water. Craig watched as Philip was dragged under. Philip died at 43. The battered midnight slider with four bullet holes in its hull, had lost its motor. Overturned, it drifted silent and alone until it was spotted at 7 a.m. in the harbor, the same harbor where Philip's home stood watch. The locals weren't overly concerned at first. They thought perhaps the town's petty thief was on the run again. The crew on the Twin Maggies continued fishing and returned to port around noon. But that night, when Philip's ball cap floated to shore and his green rubber boots were found 60 feet offshore, people started to think something sinister might have happened to him. Rumors spread quick in the small town, and someone told police that they believed the crew of the Twin Maggies were carrying a rifle. Police paid a visit to the Twin Maggies at the dock and noticed black and red scuff marks on the starboard side. The next day, James, Dwayne, and Craig were brought into the police station for questioning. While a Navy helicopter scanned the waters and dive teams searched for Philip's body. An officer told James that there was a collision at sea between the Twin Maggies and Philip's boat. James responded by waving his head from side to side and said, never seen the man. Maybe he's hiding in the woods. Then he laughed. The officer told James they saw the red and black scuff marks on the wet hull of the Twin Maggie. James denied seeing Philip on Saturday and stated the last time he saw him was Friday in thick fog. And it was Philip who ran into the bow of his boat twice, then turned around and hit it again before taking off. Then James said Philip threatened to cut all his pots, and it's not the first pot he's cut. He's been cutting our pots for ten years. On June 6, James, Dwayne, and Craig were arrested. Craig stayed silent. In James' interview, when asked if he knew why he'd been arrested, he acknowledged it was for second-degree murder, but he denied it, saying I didn't do nothing. And referring to Philip, he stated, 21 traps in a day he cut, and 10 the next day. And then what he didn't cut, 
He opened the doors, took the lobster out, and left the doors open. The next day, police searched Schwein's home and seized a number of firearms, including a Winchester rifle. A bullet recovered from Philip's boat was later forensically matched to that rifle. Police questioned James again. This time, he confessed. Referring to the shots he fired, he said, I missed him the first time. I hit the boat, I think. I'm not too sure. It's hard to say, a boat like that. Asked about the second shot. He said, I think I might have clipped him or something. Because he fell on the side like that, as James demonstrated by leaning his body over in the chair. When James was asked, when you fired those first two shots at Philip, what were your intentions? He answered, killing him. I'm telling you the truth. He's no good. He was no good. He told me not to lie, so I told you the truth. I was mad after him, and that was it. I regret to do it, but somebody had to. Police charged James, Dwayne, and Craig with second-degree murder. The charges divided the community... The crew of the Twin Maggies were well-respected and law-abiding citizens. On the other hand, Philip had no respect for the law or the community he stole from. But did he deserve to die the way he did? Some don't think so. Others thought the fishermen were pushed too far and it was long overdue. Three weeks after his arrest, Craig confessed and his details matched James's. He pled guilty to an accessory after the fact and agreed to testify for the prosecution. They felt that without Craig, they would not have had a case. He was sentenced to 28 days in jail and given probation. John went to trial a year later. The jury found him not guilty of second-degree murder, but convicted him of manslaughter. He was sentenced to 14 years. He appealed the length of his sentence, but it was denied. Dwayne pled guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 years. But neither men served their full sentence. Both were released after serving only three years. Released back into a community that to this day is still divided by their crime. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Tess Ritchie. She was blowing off steam on a Friday night. Intoxicated and feeling good, she left the bar and ran into Kalen. He waved off her cab and led her down the street to a dark stairwell. But when she spurned him, he turned evil. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. We love what we do and are dying to continue. If you enjoy listening to Murder in 20 every week, we'd be eternally grateful for your support by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murder20.com. We'd like to acknowledge Verbal Planet for use of their music, sound effect from Vaseline Studios and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.